So thank you to uh, uh, the panel members who are joining us today. I'm not sure exactly who you are, <laughs> uh, but if um, there are questions that are have arise that you think you can answer or help answer or address, then by all means, um, uh, speak up. Uh, this is meant to be an informal session, although we do have a brief presentation at the beginning. This is mostly a question and answer um, session, hopefully, anyway. Um, just, I, I think I was muted. Jen's having some trouble joining. We'll have to be oh, for a couple okay. of minutes. No problem. Yeah, I don't see her name. No, no, she just knocked on my door and said, I can't get on. <laughs> That's a problem since she has the presentation. So. So I'm just going to see how she's doing. I'll mute. Okay. Great. So if you didn't hear, I think one of our presenters, Jen, um, is just having um, a small issue joining. So we will get started in just a minute. <clears throat> Any luck, Lynn? Yeah, I think she's opening there now. <laughs> oh, hey, Jen. There she okay. is. Excellent. Great. Do you want to check to see if the presentation, or do we want to do that after? You're muted, Jen. No, I'm not. Oh, <laughs> I could only hear you through the wall. <laughs> <laughs> my computer is, but it is very slow. So. Well, I'll go ahead and um, start, and hopefully, the computer issue resolves. So, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Blundell, and I'm the associate dean of science um, for research and graduate studies here in the faculty of science. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups, and we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. We encourage everyone to reflect on these lands from where you are located and the indigenous peoples for whom these lands are traditional territories. So, uh, welcome to our monthly on the menu session, our lunch and learn series hosted by the Faculty of Science. On the menu is a full course meal covering a wide and comprehensive range of tasty topics. In the months ahead, we will intend to offer a variety of sessions um, which we hope will be of interest to both faculty and students. So be sure to keep an eye out for the news about our next event. We're also interested in hearing your ideas. If you have a suggestion for a future session, please feel free to submit it via our chat or email sciencegrants at mon.ca. Today, however, we are discussing tips for preparing your NSERC Discovery Grant application. Uh, 
In this session, the Faculty of Science Grants Facilitation team, so Lynn, Jen, and Philip, will survey the NSERC Discovery Grant process, discuss evaluation criteria, go over important changes to some NSERC guidelines, describe and differentiate between our processes, the internal comprehensive compliance and peer review, and share helpful application tips. Memorial faculty um, members with experience on NSERC evaluation groups are also in attendance um, to help us answer your questions. Before we get started, a reminder to all participants to turn off your mics um, and perhaps your cameras that may help uh, with any issues with um, this recording. The only cameras we would like to have on for the event um, are the presenters and mine as host and moderator. Uh, however, if you do have a question, you want to turn on your uh, camera, of course, go right ahead. Um, regarding questions, you can ask them directly or you can uh, put them in the chat and we will read them for you. I will remind everyone attending, as I just said, that we are recording this event um, and we will make it public on our website and on the Faculty of Science YouTube channel in the next few days for anyone who may have missed today's presentation. Anyway, thank you so much for attending and I will pass it over to Dr. Frizzell. Thank you, Jacqueline. And thanks to everyone for uh, sharing some of your time with us today. Uh, hopefully you'll find today's session useful. Um, as Jacqueline said, my name is Lynn Frizzell and I'm one of the three grants facilitators here in the Faculty of Science. Jen Major, my colleague there, um, will also share some tips with you today. And Philip McCallum, who's uh, working behind the scenes and monitoring the chat. And Philip will call on you if you have any questions. So I think we've worked with many of you before, but perhaps not all. I think I see some new names there. So, for those of you who may not know what our role is, as the Grants Facilitation Team for Science, <laughs> I'm laughing at Jen rolling through every picture on her, on her screen. <laughs> is our presentation going to come up there, Jen? Um, I don't know what anyone can see. My computer is pretty much crashing, so I think someone else needs to pull this up. Oh, Philip, can you pull it up? This was an unfortunate day for your computer to crash. Well, anyway, I can continue. <clears throat> so as the Grants Facilitation Team for Science, it's our job to assist you um, as you build and diversify the funding portfolio that supports your program of research. And so to help you in that effort, we do many things. Um, we monitor and communicate grant opportunities through the Science Scoop. We can assist with the development, review, and feedback of um, your grant applications, not just your discovery grant, but any grant application that you might be considering submitting. We develop and provide resources to help make the application process a little easier, uh, such as budget guides, guides to incorporating equity, diversity, inclusion into your applications. We have templates, approval forms, so on. We have lots of resources to help try to make that process a little easier. And we organize presentations on various topics, uh, such as this one today, um, as part of our on the menu series. And so today is our presentation of Discovery Grants competition for 2024. <laughs> I'm just going to hesitate for a moment, see if we've got our slides coming. I think Philip is uh, trying to I'll try. Apologies, everybody. Yep. Can't anticipate a computer crash, can we? Well, while he's working on that, I can continue. Um, so what exactly, what specifically can the grants facilitation team do to help with your discovery grant application? Um, we can provide a comprehensive review of your application. We've set a very early deadline. So there would be a slide there showing you that the deadline would be September 13th. Um, and we have reason why we have the deadline so early is because we do anticipate that we'll get 30, maybe more applications. And we want to allow time to give it a careful read a good review and provide feedback to you and allow you time then to make any changes that you might want to make based on our feedback. So this early deadline provides more time to allow us that back and forth as many times as necessary to create the best possible application. So in that comprehensive review, we will give your grant application a careful read 
to make sure you've addressed the very important merit review criteria. So that would mean that you have highlighted and demonstrated your excellence as a researcher and done a really good job of explicitly explaining what your contributions to your field are. We look to see that you have a well presented HQP training philosophy and training plan and that you have incorporated equity, diversity and inclusion challenges and acknowledge what the challenges are in your field and presented the actions that you are going to incorporate into your philosophy and plan to address EDI challenges. Go up Lynn? To three. I, yeah, you got I your slides. Up there, yeah, so if you can go up two or three, Philip. <laughs> Both are to the top. Here we are. Okay, that's where we are. So that's what we do. So that's our slide on some of the things that we as a team in general do. So I just wanted to take that opportunity to, to plug what we do. <laughs> so any of you who have more with us before. The next slide, Philip, please. And so this is our comp. This is the difference between our comprehensive review and our compliance review. So September 13th, the deadline for comprehensive review. Um, and I was describing what we are doing when we do that. So we're looking at the merit review criteria. We're looking to see that you've highlighted your excellence as a researcher, that you've presented a well planned out HQP training philosophy and plan and incorporated equity, diversity, inclusion in that that you've presented your application as a program of research. This is important. It's not a project grant. It's a program of research. It should incorporate your vision for your program ongoing. That it's well organized and structured to make it easy for very busy reviewers to follow and to find what they will be looking for. That you have clearly articulated what your long term and short term goals and objectives are. How your HQP are going to be incorporated into your plan. Um, what you expect your outcomes to be, what your discoveries are going to be, and what the impact of that will be. Is that going to have an impact on industry, an impact on, well, an impact in your field? How will it move the science forward, theory, methods, and so on? Uh, Jen will talk about that a little bit more. We'll look to see that it's cohesive, that all the parts agree, including your CCB. So the past contributions that you've made to HQP should be the same in your CCB as it is in your ap application. And one thing that we often see that I mention every time is the number of HQP that you say you're going to train in your HQP training plans should be the same that you're requesting funds for in your budget and the same that are tied to your objectives in your proposal. We'll look to see that your budget is accurate, that you have followed the presentation standards because you do not want to have your application rejected because of some violation of the standards. So look to see that the fonts and margins are correct, that you followed page limitations, character limitations, so on. That it's easy to read, not too technical, not too heavy on the jargon, and as much as possible, make sure that it's typo and error free. What we may not be able to do, for most of you cannot do, is provide feedback on the content, because obviously we're not experts in everyone's fields. So we, for that reason, we really encourage you to get a peer review, um, a colleague that you trust to give you good, constructive feedback. And if you don't know anyone, please contact your department head, they can help. And Dr. Blundell is nodding because she will also help you to find someone. If you don't know someone, if you're new to the university or you don't know anyone who can help you with a, with a comprehensive review of your application, please contact department head or Dr. Blundell and they'll help you find someone to do that because it's, it, it's very helpful. Um, we also provide a compliance review and this one is mandatory and the deadline for that is October 11th. So it's the policy of the faculty of science that no application will be submitted that has not been read or reviewed for compliance. The compliance review is done to ensure that you are, in fact, eligible and to be eligible. You have to hold if you're not tenured, you have and you are contractual. You have to hold a current contract of at least 3 years to be eligible to hold discovery grant funds. All sections of the applications are complete and final. We make sure that you're not submitting a draft. <laughs> and I speak from experience, <laughs> so we won't be submitting last minute applications. Try not to submit any incomplete drafts um, and we'll look to see that the rules have been followed, that you have followed those. Um, presentation guidelines. Uh, importantly, that you've acknowledged any other tri agency funds that you hold. This has to be addressed in the relationship to other funding, and you have to attach your summary of that research if it's other CIGRs or SHARC funds. We'll make sure that you're including only the contribu contributions from the past six years. So for this year, this competition year, it's 2017 and onward. Um, that doesn't include leaves, of course, but the general, the six years, it's 2017 and onward. Okay, so um, next slide, please, Philip. What are the internal deadlines and process for review and submission? I'm just going to hit these deadlines again. So 
the first step, um, this is not internal process, but it's important is that you complete the notice of intent on the NSERC portal by August the 1st, 9.30 p.m. Newfoundland time. You must submit an NOI in order to apply. You cannot submit an application if you have not completed an NOI, so please be sure to do that. If you're undecided as to whether or not you're going to apply to Discovery Grant this year, submit an NOI anyway. It at least gives you, keeps the option open for you. Um, you don't have to do anything if you change your mind later. Notify us. We'd let you know that to accept an, and not to expect an application from you, but you don't have to notify NSERC. No internal review or approval is required for the NOI. You just submit that directly to NSERC. You don't need to put anything on Romeo portal. So the next step then is to complete your draft. And again, we encourage you to do that as early as possible. Get started on the NSERC portal and on the Romeo portal or the MUN researcher portal. Um, engage with us, take advantage of the comprehensive review. As I said, the deadline is September 13th, but we will endeavor to provide as much review as time allows to all applications that we receive. And again, I'd encourage you at this stage, as early as possible to get a peer review. When you've completed your application, and by October 11th at the latest, you must submit uh, your application on the NSERC portal and on Romeo. When you submit on NSERC portal, you will get a received by administrator message. That's us. So the first stop on NSERC portal is here. So if you want to make any changes or if we give you some feedback and you want to make changes, changes based on that, you still can. We can return it to you. Only when it's absolutely finalized and you've given us the okay, and this will probably be in the very final days of October, um, only then will we submit to NSERC. And at that point, you'll see received by agency and we'll no longer be able to return it to you. Um, because we're asked about this, the purpose for submitting on the MON researcher portal, also called Romeo, is for departmental approval. This is the only mechanism. Well, this, it's the easiest mechanism by which to get a, a departmental approval. It also serves as an internal record for you and for us. And it's also the route for account setup. So when you're awarded your grant, it's going to go through Romeo portal anyway to set up your, uh, your account. And just in case it hasn't been already made clear, research initiatives and services, our central research office is not involved in the review, approval, or submission of the discovery grants that rests at the faculty level. Okay, so I'm back to the NOI because the next step in the NSERC peer review process is, is well, the next step is the NSERC peer review process. So once you've completed your application, you've worked with us, um, the next step will be it's been submitted to NSERC and they do theirs. But of course, as I mentioned, the first step is the notice of intent, which is, is before the November deadline. Um, it's good to understand the process as you're preparing your application. This is the audience for whom you're preparing your application. This is who you're writing for, the evaluation group of five people who have many other applications. Jacqueline tells me 30, 40, maybe 50 applications to read. Um, and that group of five will come together to discuss your application and vote on it. And they have 15 minutes to discuss it. Two, three, or four maybe external reviewers will also read. So this is your audience. So it's good to know how that process works because it's extremely important that your application be as easy to read and as clearly laid out as possible. And Jen will give you some tips in a few minutes on how to make that as easy, uh, as clear for the reviewers as possible. So as I mentioned, the notice of intent is the first step in the peer review process. On your NOI, you're going to provide your suggested evaluation group, five research topics, five suggested reviewers, and 10 keywords and summary of your research proposal. NSERC will use this information to assign the evaluation group and to select reviewers. So it's important that you pay careful attention to the evaluation group you select, have a look at the topics that that evaluation group um, is expert in and make sure you make a good selection. Choose your suggested reviewers and your keywords carefully. Now I can move to the next slide. Thank you. The next step in the peer review process is the scientific evaluation. So those five evaluation group members who are assigned to your application will give it a good read. They'll give it a, a review and a, uh, um, I think sort of a preliminary score. Then they come together and they discuss and rate your application. And they do so based on these three equally rated, equally weighted merit review criteria. I'll hit that again, equally weighted. So it's important that you spend just as much time on demonstrating your excellence as a researcher as you do on writing your proposal, as you do on uh, demonstrating the training plan that you have. So the excellence of the researcher will be evaluated based on your accomplishments as presented in your CCV 
and on the most significant contributions that you're going to present in your application. The merit of your proposal, of course, and the contributions to training of your HQP as you will present them in your application on your training philosophy, your training plan, and the past contributions that you've made to HQP and how your HQP are doing now. The merit indicators grid, which is on the next slide, please, Philip, shows the three criteria here and the six possible ratings that you'll be given. So exceptional, outstanding, very strong, strong, moderate, and hopefully not insufficient. <laughs> each evaluation group member assigns a rating each of the three merit criteria. This grid is critical to that review process, so we recommend referring to it as you're preparing your application. The next step in the process, the next slide, please, Philip is the funding allocation. So based on the combined ratings of the evaluation group, your application is assigned to a bin, which determines the amount of funding that you will get. Bin A is the highest level of funding, and then the funding is reduced with each successive bin within the allocated budget. Um, and I highlight that within the allocated budget because it, uh, for years, it's been the case that, the established, that an established researcher, someone beyond the first five years, has been funded if they fall into bin J, which is the equivalent of a strong, 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 but that did not happen this past year. We're not sure what's gonna happen this year. Um, we have submitted a uh, uh, query with NSERC, but have not yet gotten a response. But early, uh, sorry, established researchers this year were funded if they had a very strong in at least one of those categories. So our advice, as it's always been, will be to aim as high as you can. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Jen now to give you some very specific advice on how you can make the best possible application. Lynn, and sorry all for all my technical difficulties early. I had to shut everything on my computer except this. <laughs> um, so Lynn's already gone through a lot of this, but I wanted to highlight there are a lot of different components of the NSERC DG. So I don't want to scare you, but I want you to realize that you should start early like now would be good <laughs> because there are all these different pieces. It's not just uh, your proposal. You've got to put together a budget and justification. Um, you have to have a training plan. You have to write your most significant contributions. You have these extra additional sections and uh, the CCV um, in particular is something that can take a long time um, if you haven't worked on one ever before, or if you haven't looked at your CCV in a while, it can take, can be quite tedious. So I'd recommend um, starting those things as early as possible. Next slide, please, Phil. Um, some of the top things, if all you take from this is this slide, um, you know, and all the amazing things Lynn has already said, but um, number one thing I would say is get a peer review of your proposal. As Lynn said, um, we're not experts um in your field so having experts in your field review it um will give you a lot of help on your especially on your proposal um to use the evaluation grid and keep in mind when you're writing your proposal that your reviewers are not necessarily experts in your field so make sure that you clearly explain any everything um it can help to have a lot of it does help to have structure to your applications, so everything is very obvious, easy to find. And uh, two things that are kind of new to the NSERC DG are that you need to intentionally address equity, diversity, and inclusion, which I'm gonna talk about um, on the next slide. Um, but there are a couple different spaces where you can talk about this. The, the easiest and most obvious way is in the training plan and your philosophy. Um, demonstrating that um, you are intentionally addressing EDI. Um, you can also address it in your contributions. So this can be in your past contributions of training and also in your most significant contributions. And you should also address um, any sex or gender-based or GBA plus, so beyond, so, um, beyond sex and gender, but also looking at other demogra demographic factors if they apply to your research. And if they don't, um, explaining why. And also, um, you really need to highlight, highlight your impact. And there are some new guidelines that we'll have um, reference to in the end in the resources um, that show how NSERC is trying to look beyond the, the traditional impact that you're probably used to, which would be um, just looking at the number of papers and presentations you've had. 
um, they're trying to go beyond to show more um, a broader scope of the impact of your research. Next slide, please, Bill. So with regards to structure, <laughs> I don't know how many times you can say this, but your EG uh, reviewers are reading tons of applications. You want to make it super easy for them. We've actually created an NSERC DG kind of template guide that has headings for you. It has suggestions of um, things to write in different sections, tips. I highly recommend um, having a look at that. We'll send it out to everyone after this. Um, make sure that you very clearly identify your research objectives and any hypotheses, as well as what HQP are working on, what different things within uh, the methods section. So be sure to use bold, underline, italic, anything you can to really draw attention to these very key things. It's also important to use some white space. I know you don't have very much room in your proposal. You only get five pages, but five pages of complete text without any white space is probably not going to be a great thing when your reviewer just opens and sees that they're going to be like, oh, my God, why do I have to read this? So try to put some space in there. Um, use some diagrams, use some tables if you can. Um, another key thing that you should keep in mind is make sure that you have identified both long term and short term objectives. Um, you can't just do one or the other. You need a long term kind of vision for your program and then you also need specific objectives that you're going to address in the next five years that relate to your overall vision for your program of research. Um, another uh, thing that I mentioned that seems obvious, but it can often be overlooked is make sure that all of the different sections of your application agree. Make sure that whatever HQP you have listed in your training plan, that they're also in your proposal and that it matches the amount of funding you're asking for in your budget and your justification Make sure that those HQP that you mentioned match what you have in your CCV as well. These things can just help it look really polished. Okay, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Addressing this is a relatively new requirement. Um, the point is to, by increasing diversity, um, NSERC hopes to increase the quality, relevance, and impact of your research. And you have to address EDI in your application. Um, one thing I want to mention right up front is that this doesn't mean that you need to give demographic information about yourself or about um, the people that are in your lab. Um, they're not requesting that information and they're not going to evaluate it in any way. You can perhaps, um, if you want to say that you intentionally recruited, say you wanted to have a gender balance and you've intentionally done that, you could mention something like that if you want. Um, but that's not exactly what they're looking for when they mean addressing EDI. Um, more so what they're actually looking for is identifying specific barriers and challenges. So this could be to your lab, in your field generally, at MUN, in Newfoundland. So they can be at multiple different levels. And you need to present a plan with very specific actions to reduce these barriers. So, you have to recognize them and then come up with ways that you're going to reduce them. They don't expect that you're going to solve all the problems in the world, but what are some little things you can do to reduce some of these barriers for your lab and your field? And another thing I would like to mention is make sure that you address recruitment and retention. A lot of people um, do mention a lot of ways that they're going to recruit people from diverse backgrounds. But you also need to show how you're going to support them once they're in their lab so that they feel included and supported so that they're actually going to stay in your lab too. Next slide, please, Phil. Um, can be a little bit daunting when you first um, get started and trying to think about how you're going to incorporate this in your application. So kind of to get started, you can try to figure out who is actually underrepresented in your field. And CERC recognizes that women, Indigenous people, visible minorities, and people with disabilities are generally underrepresented in science. Um, I think you can also uh, know that um, the LGBTQT plus community is generally underrepresented, but you may find that in your specific field, um, there are 
certain groups that are more or less underrepresented. Um, for example, in math and computer science, um, the underrepresentation of women tends to be higher than some of the other NSC fields. You can also um, take a look at what societies and professional groups in your field are saying and doing. So they may have statistics that you can reference and papers you can reference about what's happening in your field. And they may have a lot of resources that you can either reference that you're using these resources or just to get ideas of things that you could actually be applying within uh, your group. There are quite a few resources at MON already. So these are things that you can reference and um, be aware of. You can also have a look at some of these sites and they could give you other ideas of things to include. Um, there are certain policies and groups at MON um, who are specific for uh, EDI and anti-racism. There's the Office of Indigenous Affairs um, that have different scholarships available for students so they don't have to pay tuition. There are resources for students. There is the RIG policy, which can help give some advice on how to um, conduct research involving or impacting Indigenous groups respectfully. There are accessibility services at the London Center. There are quite a wide variety of things for international students, which mine actually has a very high um, percentage of international graduate students. So make sure that if you have international graduate students that they know about the information sessions, um, that they can get help with immigration, housing, they could even help you get, uh, make sure that you have health insurance. There's also a lot of other student services on campus. And the Student Life is actually a really wonderful website that they tell you all the things that they offer, but they also have links to pretty much anything you can think of that a student might be looking for, whether a career advice, looking for mental health and counseling, um, food security, housing, spirituality, these things. Um, so, so these are just uh, different resources that are already at MUN that you can avail of and your HQP can avail of. Next slide, please, Phil. This slide, there's a lot of text again. These are just some examples of different things that you can do because I know sometimes just getting started can be very difficult. You may already be doing a lot of these things already and a lot of these things are quite easy to do. So if you wanna think about recruitment and retention, I, don't know, I like to look at it that way. So on the recruitment side of things, when you're trying to increase the diversity, um, make these underrepresented groups join your lab, um, probably the most important thing you can do if you haven't done already is to take unconscious bias training so that when you are interviewing potential students and candidates, you are recognizing what biases you already have. And it can also be very helpful to bring someone else along so that they have <laughs> different biases than you. And so you can kind of counteract that as well. When you're interviewing students, you can consider things kind of beyond um, what we traditionally look for in students, just GPA, number of papers, recognize that people come from diverse pathways and they may not have had access to um, all the resources that everyone else may have had. So consider motivation, curiosity, other things when you're interviewing candidates as well. Who's really gonna fit well in your lab? Um, also, if you are going to talk about recruitment, make sure that this is intentional recruitment of underrepresented candidates. If you just say that I have five females in my lab, but you don't say that you did that purposefully and that you were trying to recruit uh, women to your lab, then it doesn't mean much. It could just mean that more women applied. So make sure that you're targeting underrepresented groups. So share job postings with groups that serve these communities use hashtags on social media, make sure that you actually interact with these groups so that they know who you are. Um, you can also participate in EDI and outreach initiatives on and off campus. Um, outreach can be um, particularly useful um, when we're talking about getting women into science, um, as it shows that women, when we're quite young may be less likely to go into physics or computer science or engineering so you need to kind of reach women early on so that they pursue these and, and feel comfortable in these positions make sure that in any of your postings or when you're reaching out to groups that you use inclusive language 
Um, if you feel comfortable, I encourage you to use pronouns um, as well. And one thing I have um, seen more frequently now is um, people actually asking for money for um, specifically uh, recruiting underrepresented groups. So having more money for them, as you think they may potentially not have a, as much resources and have, be able to get scholarships, asking for money so that they can go get their visa approved and they have to go and travel for that. There are a lot of these um, things that you can do to try to get money, whether you'll get it or not, I don't know, but you can try. <laughs> um, again, with regards to it, uh, retention, you, once you have these underrepresented groups in your lab, you want to make them feel welcome. And this is this goes for everyone too. It doesn't matter if you're underrepresented. Um, making everyone feel comfortable and welcome. Um, one thing that can be really important is sharing resources with your HQP and sharing them often. If you only hand them the resources when they first join, they may be overwhelmed with all of the different things and not think about them. So sharing them, say, every six months or once a year, making sure that your HQP are aware of all the different things that MUN offers and what's in the community, and also making them feel that they're actually able to go out and do these things, so giving them the time as well. You can think about accommodation, whether it's in times of when you have your lab meetings or um, how often they have to be in the lab versus working from home. So take into consideration family or religious requirements that some of your HQP might have. Um, training is a great way, um, of course, to address EDI. Make sure that you are up to date on your EDI and your racism training and ask your, uh, encourage your HQP to do it as well. Um, one thing that I've seen more of lately in applications is individual development plans. So these are kind of formalized plans. So you'll meet with your HQP maybe at the beginning and then every six months or a year and kind of set goals so they can career goals and research goals and reevaluate. So treating your HQP as individuals and looking to see what they want and setting appropriate um, expectations uh, throughout is very helpful for anyone, regardless of their background. Um, helping identify mentors. Um, so uh, say you have someone new in your lab and they are from an underrepresented group and uh, you want to make, you might wanna make sure that they are able to reach out to and have people they can look up to that are from a similar group. So helping them find mentors. Um, and Probably one of the uh, easiest things you can do um, is to create a code of conduct shared on your uh, web lab website. Um, have formal expectations about training, authorship, uh, EDI, conflict resolution. Uh, a lot of these things are very simple things you can do that can help everyone feel comfortable and welcome. Next slide, please, Phil. So the. One of the other things that I mentioned that's kind of different now is uh, the way that NSERC addresses impact. So the most significant contribution section is probably the easiest way where you can address impact and where you really need to. So you are allowed to include up to five um, most significant contributions. For early career researchers, these tend to be um, like each contribution might be one, one paper or one work. Um, for established researchers, it's more common that each contribution might be a collection of different works on a related topic. You don't have to have five. If you're filling up uh, your, uh, you have a word limit of 9,000 characters. If you have three really great ones, it would be better to explain them really well than to have five that maybe aren't um, as strong. Keep in mind that in your most significant contribution section, you are supposed to be sticking to that six year window, but there is a little bit of wiggle room there. If you can show that the contributions from beyond that window are very important to what you're currently doing or still having a large impact on the field, then you are allowed to include them in this section as well. The thing that you probably need to do the most is to make sure that you spell out the impact in each contribution that you are including. Don't assume that the reviewers are going to know what the impact is or uh, know how useful it is 
and you have to spell it out for them. So this can be impact to the field. This could be citations, not only number of citations, but how are the people that are citing your work actually using it? Um, if you have created new methods, people are using them. Have you created software or resources that people are using? Have you been invited to present this work in different places? These are um, ways to show impact in your field. You also need to show a broader impact to Canadians or globally. So this can be industry uptake or working with industry, uh, community engagement, socioeconomic benefits, maybe um, your research on animals led to different guidelines. Um, that the government is implementing or other associations are using. You can also use this area to talk about collaborations you formed, um, especially international collaborations. Uh, knowledge translation is very important if you can show any of that. Um, and you can also even talk about impacts um, through equity, diversity, and inclusion or training that's related to these topics as well. We have started to see some researchers actually even have, say, EDI or training or knowledge translation be standalone, most significant contributions. So you can pepper these things throughout the five, or if you feel that you have a very strong program that addresses some of these things, you can make them a standalone contribution as well. Um, something that we see a lot is that make sure that you have to uh, include the, either the full citation for any um, paper you are referring to, or to save some characters, you can refer to your CCD. You can call it, say, Journal 1 or um, Conference Position 2. In addition to these impacts that you're describing in your most significant contributions, also be sure that you are embedding impact into your proposal, too. So in your proposal, generally, most people have an impact section at the end. Um, you could also talk about the impact after each objective, but make sure that when they're reading your proposal that they know what the impact is going to be um, right away or in the future as well. Um, you also have a section in your uh, application that is for additional information on contributions. This is an extra 3,000 characters, I believe, so I want to make sure um, I would suggest using those 3,000 characters. There are uh, a lot of different things you can put in there. It's not as restrictive as other sections. It's recommended um, by NSERC that you talk about authorship order, if the, especially if there's something kind of unique in your field or say you published in other fields and they have a different way of choosing authorship order, then you should probably explain that. If you, you can explain why you've chosen to publish in certain journals, maybe because they have a higher um, readership in another field that is important. Like explain who you're reaching by um, the choice of your uh, journals or the choice of where you've done presentations. You can also talk about collaborations that you have with other researchers and non-official supervisions. So, say so you were mentoring another student, you could mention that in there as well, or papers that you published with mentored students. And this is also um, a place where you can talk about service as well, service to um, service to MUN, service on fields, um, or sorry, service to the field, whether it be for an organization um, or a, a committee that you're serving on as well. Um, another thing that is new kind of in the past couple of years um, is that you can add a two page attachment for eligible leaves or delays. So when you're filling out your CCV, uh, it asks you if you have any leaves. And if you do, and if you include it on your CCV, then you're able to have an extra two pages that are free form where you can include um, basically anything that would go in your CCV. So you can include um, extra papers, presentations, HPP you trained, service um, that matches the period equivalent to the duration of your leave. So the eligible leaves are parental leaves, family leaves, medical leaves. If you include any of these in your CCV, you do not need to justify them. You just need to include the dates. Um, 
but um, importantly, you can also include um, a COVID-19 leave. So this is listed as a special leave that you have to put into your CCD and you must actually give a justification if you're putting in a COVID-19 leave. So you have to explain the impact it had on your lab and as specific dates as you can. So put in kind of an example here because um, the COVID-19 leave, sometimes it's not uh, super easy to explain um, that impact or have an exact duration of time. You might find that for certain periods, you actually couldn't do any research and for other periods, you had some productivity. So you can actually um, break it out and explain um, how it impacted over these different time periods and then add them all up. And so in this example, there was 11 months um, that were lost um, in productivity. So this means that you could then include an extra 11 months um, of activities that you couldn't include in your CCD. So this would mean you could go back into 2016 to talk about these things. So this can be um, very useful and I definitely encourage you to use this if you have taken any leaves or if COVID has had any impact on your program, which I imagine for many of you it has. Slide, please. Oh, Phil, do you actually want to speak to RTI? Uh, not at the moment, but if anyone wants to contact me, if they're interested, they can definitely do so because I have not really looked at this year's. Uh, okay. Um, just briefly, there is a research tools and instruments grant that you can apply for for equipment to support your NSC research. Um, if you're applying for this, it's for things that cost between $7,000 and $250,000. Um, you can get up to $150,000. Um, you'll need quotes um, for, uh, for this system. And you can have more than one piece, but all of the things that you include, they have to be part of a cohesive comprehensive system. Um, and something that's new in the past year is that if you received an RTI last year, and you are successful as a primary or co-applicant, you can't apply again the next year. You have to wait an extra year. And of course, we can give you more um, advice on RTI if you're interested in applying for one. And uh, oh, this is just a slide we have um, that'll be available on our website with links so you can see some of the resources we've created in the past, some of the resources and webinars that NSERC is holding as well. Oh, and oh, also the RTI program. So that's great. Thank you so much, Lynn and Jen and Philip uh, for putting that together with lots of helpful tips. Uh, there was a couple of questions in the um, chat. Uh, Rob, um, I don't know if you wanted to speak or I could just read it out. Um, that's a pretty common question. Uh, should contributions be NSERC specific or could other works, for example, from NIH or CIHR be included? I guess I could take that. I wasn't sure if you were going to answer. <laughs> oh, yeah, I could. Uh, I, I just, yeah, if you want to so go ahead. In the most significant contributions, you should stick to NSE contributions. Um, and actually, one thing that I, I forgot to mention. Um, if your research kind of straddles, uh, say, uh, NSERC or it's CHR or SHRC, um, in the additional information and contributions, or even in the CCD itself, there are spaces where you can explain what percentage of a work is NSE content versus CIHR or SHRC. Um, you do really need to um, describe the impact that it has on it can have other impacts as well, but what you need to focus on is the benefit to um, NSE. Yeah, and if you want to raise the NIH uh, or CIHR contributions, that you can include that in your um, HQP as you can talk about the impact in those fields um, in that section. But for, yeah, I agree with Jen. For the actual contribution section that needs to be NSE. And I know for my research in particular, which kind of straddles health and 
um, NSE, I have to be really careful in um, explaining what the NSE content is, especially if the journal is something like the Journal of, you know, Anxiety Disorders. Um, if I publish in that, I have to be really careful in explaining the con the NSE content because otherwise it'll be dismissed as a health related um, in contribution and it won't be counted. Uh, is that okay? Uh, does that answer your question, Rob? Are you good? Mm -hmm. Uh, next is Mark Berry. So for student supervision on CCV, just asterisks own students or students of collaboration or collaborators who contributed to outputs. Instructions just say identify students with asterisks. Oh, I always just use my own students. I'm not sure. I don't know if Lynn or Jen have anything to add to that. Yeah, I'm just looking at the instructions now, Jacqueline. And mm -hmm. it says identify each student author with an asterisk which appears to imply that all student authors should be identified with an asterisk but i know in the past they said it was just your own it well in the past they said you, to identify your own hqp so there appears to be a bit of a change there and i'm just not clear mark it's yours the ones that you supervise or co-supervised only we, we can reach out to NSERC though, if, if the wording is kind of different to clarify. We, we've yeah. always been under the impression, like you said, that it should only be your own students. And if you want to talk about students who are not in your lab, but you had, um, you know, they published papers with you or you had some mentorship or anything, you could talk about that in your uh, training plan section. Rob, did you, Rob Bertolo, did you have something to contribute to that or? Yeah, sorry, we, we do run into this sometimes, uh, Mark, and it's, um, I, I think the key thing is that if there's a disconnect between what you list in your um, supervision and then you asterisk all sorts of people will notice it and not sure why you did that. Um, and so it becomes unclear quickly, but if you are a close collaborator with somebody, you can just put them down as close supervision. Nobody is actually going to check, you know, program of study forms to see if you're there. If you did supervise a student, I would just include it as a co-supervised student or or explain it somehow. And then that way the asterisk makes more sense. But we do see sometimes where people just put all sorts of things in there and it's not looking good. And that falls into the sloppy category, which doesn't bode well. Great. Thanks, Rob. Uh, so does are we comfortable with that answer, Mark? Or did you want us to reach out to answer? No, that that's fine. It's, like, I noticed a couple of people have posted instructions from elsewhere on the NSERC website, which appear to use very different word in there on the CCV, which is always helpful. Uh, but we don't need to go down that alley. So your next question, so the de delays just call it everything a leave on the CCV? Yeah, again, I know in the past it used to say, uh, Del delays or leaves, and now it just says leaves. Yeah, so the COVID-19, I mean, it's not really a leave, but um, it gives you the option and you're supposed to pick um, like special circumstance, I think. And then in the section where you describe it, say that it's a COVID-19 and give that explanation. Okay, yeah, thanks. Great. Um, any other questions? Uh, you can raise your hand or you can put it in the chat. I think, or you can just speak up. That's also an option. Uh, Kandemir, is there any difference between first renewals and other renewals for ER in terms of evaluation criteria? I don't think there's any difference between renewals. I think the only difference is ECRs versus everyone else. Um, and ECRs, uh, can you remind me, Jen or Lynn or Philip, 
that's the first five years. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I thought. Yeah. Otherwise, there's no difference. Everyone else is just considered old. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Everyone else is in the same bin. And so ECR is one thing I'm not sure if you mentioned ECRs um, are scored the same as non ECRs, but if they get a moderate for the HQP, um, it is still considered fundable. Uh, unlike if there's a moderate for uh, any non ECRs, um, although that appears to be changing. Uh, I don't know what to say other than to make sure the not the fluff words or the 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 words you use to describe your research, your impact, your training plan match with the criteria on the chart for very strong or above. Uh, would be my recommendation for this coming year. Um, as a reviewer, and I'm others reviewers may speak to this, but as a reviewer, we often look for these key terms um, on the grid that match what you say in your application. It's not the only thing we look for. We actually look for the demonstration of it, but it's really helpful if you match your adjectives with the adjectives used on the grid. Um, it just makes for, as, as Lynn and Jen pointed out, you know, the reviewers are reviewing, reviewing probably on average of 40 applications from January or December the 22nd, which is when I think I got mine to February 10th or whenever the panel is. That's not a lot of time, especially if you're teaching and you have your own program of research going. So, um, you know, you have to consider how making it as easy as possible to the reviewers. Um, as obvious as possible to the reviewers. Yeah, and if I can add to that, Jacqueline, we always say mirror the language, and that's probably where Jen and Philip and I are most helpful, because as I said, we're not experts in your field, but we can certainly help to make it as crisp and clean and concise and make sure you've highlighted the points and mirrored the language that's in the merit uh, grid so that re reviewers can very quickly find what they're looking for. So when you've got that 15 minutes, I can imagine I've never been there, but in that 15 minutes and you're defending this application that's yours to, to present, that you can find the information very quickly. Yeah. And the first reviewer only gets three minutes. So while you can have up to 15, the person who speaks first gets three minutes. And so, or four, three or four, I forget exactly, but the point is not a lot of time. And so if you can make them make your points to them as easy as possible, um, it's it's better. Uh, Rob, I know that you sit on NSERC, the NSERC panel. Do you have any advice that we maybe didn't cover or anyone else who sits on the panel? Do they have any advice that, you know, uh, was really sort of apparent in your um, panel this year? Uh, sure. Couple of years. Sure, I can make a comment. The um, <clears throat> I had a list of things that I was going to comment on, but actually Jen covered a lot of them really, really well. So uh, we don't <laughs> need to go on them a lot. But the the EDI statement, I know Jen spent a lot of time on that, but that is actually a really, really important discussion piece in these sessions, and that is often a discriminator in that HQU section. If you do not write a very specific, detailed EDI plan incorporated in there, it will be noticed. And it often results in a knock or two down from what you could add. Um, so those statements are really, really critical. And it's also an opportunity if you don't have a lot of HQP to boost that grade up because a really well written HQP section, even if you don't have a lot of students, actually gets you um, a much higher grade than somebody who's got a lot of students, but a poorly written one. So, so you really need to take advantage of that piece. Um, and I know Jen mentioned also about the program being a program and not projects. And this is often a discussion that we have because it's difficult to distinguish sometimes because when you write your projects out or your plan, it's often looks like a series of projects, which it should be, right? Because you're trying to explain experiments. Um, but anytime there's a discrepancy or, or discussion about, geez, is this really a series of projects or is it actually a program? In, in the end, we always go to the long-term objective statement. 
And that's where it has to be clear it's a program in that one, two, one or two sentences. If it smells like a summary of short term objectives, then it's going to get slammed as a project and not a program. So that make sure your long term objectives really reads like a vision that's 10 or 15 years down the road and not just a summary of what you've already written because that's um, that's usually where you end up going to see if it's a program or project in the end. Yeah, I know in our panel, we like to see future experiments or future goals, um, you know, based on the outcomes of this, we're going to move in this direction or whatever. And that sort of spoke to the, um, yeah, prog or the prod, no, the, the long term sort of program oh, versus project. project. Yeah. Yeah, it just needs to be in a con somebody wanted to repeat that, but it, it just needs to be in the context of, uh, you know, like, like what. In 15 years, what do you want to accomplish and how is this a piece of that? That's kind of how you have to envision it. And your long term statement should be clear on that, including the future directions. But that's just just pay some, you know, take a little extra time on that long term objective statement because it does carry a lot of weight. Uh, and then the only other piece of advice I'd throw in there, um, I know we mentioned about the most significant contributions. And I think a lot of researchers kind of think about that as, you know, your best papers or your best results that led to something. Um, but you can be more creative in that section. I've seen a lot where people put in, you know, they developed a course for graduate students at their university, which, you know, is a contribution to the field or to your expertise or, or whatever. That is not necessarily the results of a paper, but actually has quite significant impact. And so those kinds of things can be spun into, you know, your most significant contributions. It doesn't have to be a research finding that, you know, wowed, the, wowed your field or anything. Um, and then the only other thing I'd say is that I know that that. Excellence of the research is kind of tricky and it's hard if you don't have a lot of experience or you don't do a lot of talks or, you know, sit on a lot of boards. Um, but some things that are in your power are things like society engagement. So, in the end, if we don't see a lot of things like that, are you involved in your fields, society, national society, international societies? How are you involved? Are you helping with the training of HKP there? Are you, you know, providing some, you know, whatever, but sitting on which committees? But that kind of stuff just adds up into impact. You know, beyond just you and your lab. That's a great Steve's point. asked if you could repeat the discussion about projects versus program. If either Rob or Jackie wants to say that again. Uh, Rob, if you sure. want to go ahead. <laughs> um, the whole thing. Okay, so basically, what I was saying is that it, like sometimes we get a discussion when you write out your series of their three or four projects it's, it looks like projects that kind of link to each other but they often are distinct with you know you have a question and this is the answer i'm going to find and then it goes to the next one and if somebody is wondering whether or not that sits within a program they always end up going to your long-term objective statement and it needs to be clear there that you have a vision well beyond these three or four projects or these three experiments and if it doesn't if it looks like it's just a summary of those projects which a lot of long-term objectives look like then you can be accused of it being a series of projects, in which case you will get an insufficient on the merit of the proposal. Um, it has to look like a program. And it's tricky. I know it's not, uh, it's not clear. It's a lot of, there's a lot of semantics here. Um, but like I said, if in the end, if there's a discussion, we always go to that long-term objective statement. And this is, it, this highlights, I think, the point that we're trying to make, which is peer review is really important. <laughs> Uh, getting our comprehensive review is really important. The more eyes you can have on your application, chances are the more success you will have. Um, uh, and so please take advantage of our, um, our opportunity or the opportunities you have here at the university. Um, That's a good question, but I don't think anybody would ever bring it up because that would be ageism. <laughs> as, I, as I say, I know, I know no one would officially bring it up, but is this something that's in the back of people's minds uh, when they're looking at some of these applications? And is it something that needs to be uh, potentially mitigated by presenting, say, the 15-year programme? with a view to the field as a whole rather than your individual research program is kind of what I was meaning. I mean, obviously, no one's going to say they're old, we shouldn't give them money, but. 
Mark, the only thing I can say, uh, to, that's a good idea, um, you know, to sort of how your contribution, how you can, you know, will have a bigger contribution to the field. But again, we got to think about the fact that there are 40 or 50 applications. You have a limited amount of time and you have about 15 minutes or 10, 10 to 15 minutes to talk about it. I don't think that would make the list, generally speaking, of things that are going to be top of mind. Um, when you have the proposal to talk about, you have, I, I think the project versus program is really important, but I don't think people are paying that much attention to how many years you have left, I, I, I at least. And plus, some people get their PhD early, some people get them late. There's no way for us to know where really you are kind of thing. I Not, not in any, at least not that I've ever paid attention to. I don't know, maybe I'm not a great reviewer, but I don't know, Rob, what do you think? Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember. I don't think I ever know the age. No. I know them. Like I just, there's no real easy mechanism unless you throw it in your most significant contributions and talk about your 50 years career. But otherwise we just don't do the math on. No. Age. I have no idea what stage of career. Yeah. I wonder, yeah. does it matter that you're, so we often advise start out your proposal with vision of my, the overall, the overarching goal of my program of research is. And so this is predates what you've done. We'll see you through the next five years and, and, and guide you through the future. So maybe it doesn't matter so much that it's just future oriented, but that this is what my program of research is about. I'm trying to use AI to cure disease. Well, cure disease is health. I'm trying to use AI to do something, or I'm uh, trying to understand the underlying mechanisms to memory and forgetting or whatever. If that's your overarching goal, then that gives vision to what you're doing and, and in the next five years, I hope to accomplish one, two, three, four objectives or whatever. And maybe it won't matter so much that it's forward looking. Yeah, that's a good, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how that would be received. I guess in the end, I mean, the easiest thing to do is just to have a future, whether <laughs> you're gonna do it or not. <laughs> <laughs> you could just assume yeah, somebody else is gonna carry your torch, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like, like Jacqueline said to is stating in the impact what in the uh, in the last part of your proposal, what you expect your impact to be and where you would go in the future or where, you know, what the future contribution would be, I suppose, would help. Pull your program into the future. Yeah, I, I think it's if it looks like a series of contracts where you have a question, you get the answer and you're done. Yeah, then it's not going to pass the, the smell test. Yeah. <laughs> So you gotta be careful. Yeah. It has to end that it stimulates more questions, right? More questions and more research right. has to That's has right. to come out of it. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. The other thing I just a small note that um was relevant to my panel was making sure that the uh, individual objectives, while they can be related, they don't depend on each other. And I know that's mm -hmm. the case for all grants, but if one um one objective is dependent on the outcome of the of a previous one, then that's um, screams issues with feasibility if yours doesn't work. Or you have a mitigation plan, like you have some sort of yep. plan to say, if this doesn't work, then I'll do that. Um, well, I saw that primarily in CIHR. Um, that seems to be now the later times, the later years that I've sat on NSERC, that seems to be incorporated into NSERC and appreciated. So um, keep that in mind in your proposal. You really need a mitigation plan. Anyone else have any uh, anything they'd like to any questions they might have or any comments they'd like to make? If you have yet to provide your feedback, if you were unsuccessful last year, please do so. Um, it really helps with uh, us learning the for you as well as for the community. Um, as a whole, uh, we would love to see any um, feedback that you have. We're going to just so everyone knows, we're going to update those. Those slides will be on the on the menu page of our uh, faculty of science webpage. And please have a look at when the webinars are happening. And Sark is going to present webinars just actually once afternoon. If 
started out. It's already started, <laughs> but it's in French. But there's English ones on Thursday and later in the month, um, or July, I think. And there will be discovery grant application webinars as well. So one for the NOI and one for the discovery grant. So we'll have the links to all that. And Philip probably has it in the science scoop as well. And so I guess the take home is if you have any I thought that you might apply for NSERF, submit your NOI. <laughs> Even if you decide not to, it's important to get that in because otherwise you're out of luck. <laughs> uh, and I know this seems overwhelming and I have an NSERF due in or I'm hoping to apply for this fall and I'm overwhelmed right now. <laughs> so I can only imagine. Um, uh, how you guys are feeling as well, um, or, but the best thing to do is get started. Um, and we can help with different sections. It doesn't have to be a complete package for review. Um, if you have your HQP se section done, or if you're struggling, uh, maybe you're writing the EDI section and it's not coming together like you wanted, reach out to one of us. Um, we are keen to help. Um, at any stage in the development of your application, um, I think. Lynn, Jen, yes, is that absolutely. Okay? <laughs> yes, and you, I, we, I talked a bit about the insert portal and Romeo portal because it's important that you get started on those. But you can send us things by email if you feel like you just can't seem to get started. Come talk to us. We'll um, send us a draft. We're happy to start with any part. So we, uh, I don't know if we'll have another set session in August. I don't know. We did last year, I believe. Um, we'll see how it goes and how many questions come up uh, throughout the summer or if anything changes. Otherwise, uh, know that we're here to help support you and to help the success rates of the university <laughs> in particular uh, increase for Tri-Council. Um, you know, how good we are at getting our insert grants um, reflects not only in the faculty of science, but also in the packages we get for things like CFI and CRC. So, um, it's really important. Um, and so that's why the Dean's office and the university in general have put supports in place, um, for tri council applications. So please, um, take advantage. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks. Uh, to those attending um, to help uh, and as well as the applicants. Good luck. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> Thank you.